dad, you've, you've loved me so much um, since I was a baby, so much that it's ridiculous. And he said, well, that's what love is, ridiculous. And I'll never forget that. And he just, when I asked him what, what advice at the time, I, I just turned 40. And I said, what advice would you give um, for me for the, for the next 40 years of my life? And he said, just love everybody. So dad was very much about love. And he embodied that. He wasn't perfect. I'm not going to sit here and, you know, um, glamorize him by any stretch of the imagination. But he was, he taught me a lot. And I think in hindsight, he absolutely continues to teach me. And I feel his presence. And I feel when things um, go a certain kind of way that he's had his, that he has his hand in it in some way. So even just where I'm sitting right now, this is um, an apartment that I just moved into in the last couple of months. Um, and it's in the same building that I moved in um, in 2018. And it happens to have um, this um, panoramic view of Randwick Racecourse. Now, my father loved horse racing and he loved gambling. And uh, I, I just, and the way this apartment came about was miraculous and sudden and perfect. Um, and I just, I can't help but thinking, even though my hair is all really messy at the moment, I keep doing this. Um, my father was a part of the process in some way. I'm a hundred percent sure of it. Welcome to Wellness Spring, our one-stop shop for education, inspiration, motivation and optimal wellness. Learn from top experts and exceptional people. So welcome everyone to Wellness Springs and I'm so happy to announce that my guest today is the lovely Phyllis Foundis, who is an absolutely remarkable soul and a true inspiration for all women. And I can testify to that because I've actually seen her in action twice at a Silver Sirens event, which was organized by another dynamic soul, Faith Agugu. And both these ladies are real dynamos. I was absolutely blown away with um, Phyllis's lovely energy. And um, I read this morning when I was doing a little bit of uh, catch up that essentially she's open to life's magic, passionate people, unconditional hugs and organic dark chocolate. And um, not necessarily in that order, but all at once. And that is definitely me also. So I, <laughs> <laughs> I know we've got all those things in common and I know from watching you in action that it's going to be a lovely, lively chat and without further ado, I would like to say welcome Phyllis and thank you so much for giving up your precious time to come on the show today. It's my pleasure and you've no idea when we talk about divine timing, Beverly. You've no idea how divine the timing of this particular conversation at this time, you know, in this moment, in this hour means to me. So thank you for the opportunity. And I know it's been a little bit of a to and fro situation in the lead up to this conversation, but I'm glad that we had the patience and you persisted and I respect and admire that in you and I recognize me and you, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I believe we are one, so we mirror each other. So what we like or dislike in someone is the same that we need in ourselves to work on. So it's great. So thank you. And mm -hmm. um, so for our lovely audience, I'd like to give a little background information. So Phyllis is a multi award winning TV host, TED talker, writer, producer, and she is crazy about people and loves words, long ones, short ones, neat ones, and even dirty ones. And especially, she, ones. especially dirty ones. 
Uh, I'm so lucky and I've got so much to share with you on this um, podcast, especially, you know, about your little antics with TEDx and so forth. But I'll just continue with your bio. And um, so regarding the short ones, neat ones and dirty ones, she's written billions of them in ad campaigns, books, and even one woman shows, online articles, scripts and speeches for top agencies like Ogilvy and Meta and brands like Mercedes and Dior. Wow, I feel very honored to be in your presence. And um, then after 25 years as copywriter, Phyllis took a leap of faith or as she says in inverted commas, she lost her mind. <laughs> I would say that stepping into innocence and just being in the zone and going with the flow. And magic then happened because in 2004, she performed her own, very own self-penned one woman show called The Virgin Club. And it was staged in London's West End, the Edinburgh Festival and Melbourne's International Comedy Festival. And then in 2018, she released her book, The Joy of Sags, Sexual Adventures from the Premenopausal Frontline. And ladies, you don't have to be premenopausal because when I picked up this book at Phyllis's speaking event, I thought, oh, who could I give it to? And she was like, no, no, no. You need it for yourself. And I'm like, but I'm not premenopausal. I didn't even go through a menopause. And she's like, doesn't matter. You find it of interest. So mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, and I was pleasantly surprised. And I'll let you know why a bit later. Um, okay. <laughs> <it's intriguing. laughs> and this book is actually for women of all ages. And Phyllis is also currently filming her new interview series, A Little Bit of Lip, commissioned by Netflix. And this is only tiny tasters of what she does. Oh my God, you are truly, truly unstoppable. And I can see in the background that you've got your lovely lip lounge. Yes. And... Um, well, when I was at the event, I was blown away. And of course, everybody was racing and queuing up and having their pictures taken on the lip lounge. And I had yeah. one taken with Jackie Coyne recently on it. And we put it yes. on Instagram yeah. and we just had so many comments. It's like everybody really? wants to, yeah, everybody wants to know the story behind it. But I think before we delve in, it would be really great if you could tell the audience about your background, because I like to go into the nitty gritties to know what makes you click, like where you grew up, the, your nationality, et cetera, mm -hmm. and your education, family, siblings. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll keep it brief because I'm sure there's so much more just by your introduction that you have other things that you want to explore. So... Uh, I'm basically, um, uh, I come from um, Greek Egyptian parents. I'm an only child or my, my father's youngest child. And sorry, my father's only child, but my mother's youngest child because mum was married before she met my father. And she's got three other children from her first marriage. And so I was the, I was not the afterthought. I'm going to say I was the um, uh, last cab off the rank. Uh, which is interesting and it's a cool segue into the fact that my father was um, a cab driver for many, many, many years in Sydney, 40 years. And I, um, he was quite an incredible man in terms of his ability to connect with people in his cab. And he would come home on the weekends and um, we would go to the, to the the typical big fat Greek family gatherings. And my father would hold audience. And at the time, I didn't realise or appreciate the magic of what he was doing because no one in the family had those experiences and those um uh gritty understandings of people from every walk of life and my father just had a knack of telling the story uh based on his connections fleeting connections with these people in his cab and make people laugh laugh um uh moved and it was a real gift and i think in many ways uh i've carried on that mantle 
I would definitely say that you have because um, listening at Silver Sirens to your interview with Kathy Lett, you mm -hmm. had everybody in fits laughing, the whole room was um, in tears of laughter. Kathy is very easy to talk to and we've we've met before many, many, many years ago in London and so we have that um, rapport, I guess, but even if even if we'd only just met and with people who I've only just met, I, I, I try um, to show you that I'm genuinely interested in your story and what and what you have to say because I think that's how connection happens when you are genuinely engaged with someone else and I think living in in a time now where it's all online and we're losing very very quickly if we haven't already that um, art of connection and that um, uh, ability to be intimately connected with someone when we first meet them and by intimacy I'm not talking about sex obviously but it's just that that uh human ability to to just connect with someone you know and yeah. I despair of it I despair of where the world is going oh th the same here and for many years I taught I I taught networking skills and mm -hmm. what people are craving for as you rightly said is heart-to-heart -heart connection and I couldn't believe it, like a lot of people could speak at a boardroom. I had one lawyer that I coached, she could speak at the boardroom, speak at work events to thousands of, thousands of people. But when it came to right. changing jobs and have to meet new staff, she freaked out because they've lost the art of social conversation. And right. many people are like that. They might be fun at work, but they couldn't stand up in a wedding. But it's yeah. about... Um, obviously, your father, you know, taught you on another level how to connect from your heart. And, you know, a lot of cab, cab drivers are like um, counsellors as well. So it's wonderful you got this gift. Yeah. And yeah. Um, I know that you were very close to your father and it, you were deeply um, upset and hurt when he transcended. You, and I know you had remarkable life events happening after that. Would you like to firstly say how important family is to you and um, what happened when your father did pass? Um, yeah, I mean, Dad, Dad passed in um, 2011 and it was an ordeal on many levels because I, I never um, lost someone so close and integral to who I am and certainly what he represents in in my what what he represented and what he continues to represent in my family and I'm talking about my intimate family so my two sons and certainly my mother um but I think what was very difficult about that time and almost a bit of a godsend was that I I had um a fixed period of time with him where um he was in a um you know a proper hospice um for people who are um, passing from cancer. And I had two, so my youngest boy at the time was, he wasn't even two yet. And my eldest um, was uh, just about to turn five. And we would just spend weekend after weekend there. I'd go in with the pram, with the boy's father as well. Max would fall asleep in the pram. We'd kind of shunt him off into the corner. And um, then it, it turned, um, it when the things when things deteriorate it's kind of difficult for me to talk about because it's right. just yeah um they would um the who i call the earthbound angels so the um staff of 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 an actual hospice they are remarkable beyond description they recognized that being there for someone at the end of life versus being there when someone is born is just as much a gift and just as much a blessing and an honor and they and they treat their roles as such and so they would move in a little fold away bed for me into dad's room and I pretty much slept there every night um, until I got I got sick um, I got a stomach bug and I just I had to go and spend a couple nights away but I was there with him day and night he he had lost his ability to talk which for my father would have been really frustrating because he loved talking and he was whispering and we had lots of um intimate conversations and there was one conversation which I talk about in my in my TED talk 
where uh, I said, Dad, you've, you've loved me so much um, since I was a baby, so much that it's ridiculous. And he said, well, that's what love is, ridiculous. And I'll never forget that. And he just, when I asked him what, what advice at the time, I, I just turned 40. And I said, what advice would you give um, for me for the, for the next 40 years of my life? And he said, just love everybody. So dad was very much about love. And he embodied that. He wasn't perfect. I'm not going to sit here and, you know, um, glamorize him by any stretch of the imagination. But he was, he taught me a lot. And I think in hindsight, he absolutely continues to teach me. And I feel his presence. And I feel when things um, go a certain kind of way that he's had his, that he has his hand in it in some way. So even just where I'm sitting right now, this is um, an apartment that I just moved into in the last couple of months. Um, and it's in the same building that I moved in, um, in 2018. And it happens to have, um, this, um, panoramic view of Randwick race course. Now my father loved horse racing and he loved gambling. And, uh, I, I just, and the way this apartment came about was miraculous and sudden and perfect. Um, and I just, I can't help but thinking, even though my hair is all really messy at the moment, I keep doing this. Um, my father was a part of the process in some way. I'm a hundred percent sure of it. Yeah. I'm also 100% sure of it as well, because, um, I believe when we die, it's only our physical body and our soul or spirit or life force essence continues. And you can feel the presence of people and call upon them. And he did play such an integral part of your life. And it's wonderful that you still communicate with him right now. And what about your mum? What was her background? And is she still alive? Is she around? Mummy, mum is still with us. She's a force of nature. She's 92, wow. going strong. Yeah. She lives on her own. Um, she's fiercely independent. You know, she's slowing down a little bit. She can't do as much as she used to, obviously, a year ago, two years ago. Um, but she only lives about 10 minutes away from me, and I try and see her as often as I can. She was here over the weekend. And, um, yeah, she's her, – her and I have got an interesting – um, you know, relationship. She's a very strong personality and so am I. So I think the older I get, the more I realize that I get her fire yeah. and my father's arm. <laughs> so I'm a, a combination of the mercurial uh, versus the, you know, the more kind of peaceful approach to life. But I think um, I respect the operation of both of those in me or both of those sides of uh, me because it means that I can activate um, certain aspects of me if I want to achieve Wonderful. certain things <laughs> <laughs> it's like yin and yang night and day it was interesting you said that the carers um, are very um, loving and special people because yes. um, you were very blessed it's not always that way but I think in general especially like I know in UK they have Macmillan's nurses who um, self-funded and now they um, do a lot of fundraisers for their salaries right. and they go into homes and they generally care about people and um, I think it's truly magical I was blessed to be with um, my parents when they trans my father anyway when he transcended and many other souls and it's just yeah. amazing you know, to witness it and then see the calm on people's faces when they do transcend. And it's almost like they're smiling and just feeling that love energy. So I know today it's very hard because, you know, since all the constant lockdowns, we've been battling for my father-in-law to get carers and looking at homes and everybody is overworked and running ragged and you know when we did a trial they weren't turning up or they turn up late and then they were off sick and oh, anyway right. we finally I know it's a global problem but we finally found a good place for him but anyway um back to you <laughs> so you covered so much um, in your lifetime and I know in 2003 you put your big brands on ice and you wrote the Virgin Club a semi 
autobiographical account of your life as a 20-something virgin. Could you please tell mm. us more about that? Uh, well, I um, I lost my virginity when I was 26, and at the time I felt like it was the the uh, bane of my existence, and and um, I judged myself based on that um, on that situation. And I and the reason why I wrote that book is because I wish there was something like that um, back in my early 20s when I just I just would would be so. Um, frustrated and just so and focusing on it to the point where it became to for want of a better phrase a monkey on my back and I wish someone had just tapped me on the shoulder and said you know what it doesn't define you and it really doesn't and I think the emphasis that we place no, no matter how old you are on you know um sex and feeling a certain kind of way and being with a certain person and it's it's um I think it takes away from who we are not only as women but certainly as human beings and so I just um and yes I've written a book about um sexuality but as I keep telling everyone who picks up the book and they go oh, it's a book about sex it's actually not it's you know sex is a manifestation of our sexuality absolutely but it is not the one defining thing of our sexuality so yeah, yeah, you have to look at the whole picture, but um, oh, I, yes. I I think for you, it, you know, it's really needed to be education in schools because I know when I was growing up, my mother was a very shy and would never talk about sex and it was like taboo. So, mm -hmm. and then in school, if you, you're a virgin, they all, it's like you, you've got a big stigma. Nobody wants to be near you. There's something wrong with you. And right. a lot of people um, get forced into having sex for the wrong reason. And it's not a pleasant experience. And, you know, it could be anywhere behind a nightclub or in a field or someone's house, just a quick wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, and no feelings for the girl and et cetera, et cetera, you know, with what you go through, usually the hymen breaking and the bleeding. So I think it's really good. Um, just um, a while back, um, I was talking to some ladies and they were even saying, you know, the girls at school, some of them, one of their daughters came home, was 13 and saying, um, oh, I went to the cinema, blah, blah, blah. And I give so-and-so a blowjob. And they were like, what? And they were like, oh, yeah, they won't talk to us unless we do that. It's, oh, it's nothing. It's only a blowjob. And the mother was questioning them, thinking maybe they don't know. And apparently it's really big. And um, you talked about support as well. And I know people get bullied in school. And, you know, that, and not only children, everybody at various ages are lonely. It's like a huge issue around the world you know people are lonely and sad because they haven't found that in a touch but anyway you've got two sons who are now teenagers what do they yes. think about you talking about sex and menopause and so forth um yeah it's hilarious actually because um, they're, <laughs> they're very engaged and very intelligent young men and so uh there was um, a running gag when I was um, when I actually published my book, and the eldest um, picked up the first, and you know the, the the book turned to the first page, and the first line is, uh, you know, the world needs more old sluts, and he just keeps repeating that. It's like, Mama, really, is this how you're going to begin the book, really? And they they're not backward in coming forward in telling me what they think, which I love, and that's how we've raised them to question and to give their points of view. And sometimes it's a bit confrontational, and sometimes it's it's but very, very, very welcome. Um, but I think, and now the youngest has cottoned on to the fact that all I talk about is menopause, which is also not true. But I guess in their world and in their minds, uh, their their mother talks a lot about these um, particular topics. I think, though, that the um, the upside to all that is that they they understand that uh, you know there's 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 not much that's gonna that's that's going to shock me, and I'm. I'm very open with both my sons, you know, both their father and I are very open with the things that we discuss. And, but it's a very um, 
just based on the conversations that that we've had and the experiences that we've had with some of their peers as well, females, you know, girls, uh, the teenage girls of this generation are a far cry from what you and I were like. Uh, they are far more forthright, aggressive in some ways, and I think hypersexualized. And I have a real issue with that because I think with the advent, advent of um, you know with social media technology um, expanding as rapidly as it is and continues to, where we're just creating an environment where these girls feel the pressure to be a certain way, way beyond the time that they're really ready to be in, in that. I mean, I, I, I look at some of the girls and, and the way that they're dressing and not to be approved, but the way that they're dressing, the way that they're speaking, the way that they're behaving. And it's like, are you really ready to be this at 15, 16, 17, not realizing that you have plenty of time to grow into who you really are and to to respect and honour yourself far beyond what a man or or another woman thinks of you. Yeah, and as I said, it's all about peer pressure and it's all about we're living in a fast world with social media and everybody wants likes on their Facebook page or, yeah. you know, Snapchat or TikTok, whatever the youngsters are using today. And it's about that need to feel wanted and approval and be liked. And they seem to sacrifice it above all. But um, yeah, so I, I just think it's funny. Do you want to tell us about your TEDx talk? Because um, you actually faked an orgasm on stage and in your oh, one man show. Yeah. Spoilers, Beverly. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Oops, sorry, well, you know, I'm hoping I'm, I'm hoping people people watching this are going to now still go and go and watch. It. I was having a conversation. I had a, um, uh, I had a meeting yesterday, and um, uh, this particular lady had seen that I'd given a TED talk, and I said, "So have you have you watched it yet?" She said, "No, I haven't." I said, "Well, it's quite enlightening, but um, I would suggest, and it's it's a roller coaster ride, so I would suggest that um, you know that going in, but you also wear headphones because there is some." what some people would deem as explicit content. And I didn't want to tell her <laughs> much more than that. Um, but yeah, I mean, my, you know, that, um, so that TED Talk came about around the same time that dad passed. And so the the memory of losing him and of being right at his bedside when he passed was very vivid and still very um, clear in my mind and certainly in my heart. And so I wanted to talk about, I mean, the whole, the whole idea of that talk was about the light bulb moment and you know, the question is, when do they come to you? And for me, it's when I surrender and when I am not in control. And I am a self-confessed control freak. Um, and so that was um, something that I had that I had realized that when my father was passing and there was nothing I could do about it, I could write all the journals in the world. I could read all the brochures about being with a loved one who was going you know, who is in the final stages of life and what happens and all the scientific nitty gritty. But the, but the reality was that I, there was nothing I could do. And so the only control I had was the writing that I was doing and the conversations that dad and I had. And, um, you know, we've all heard that um, cliche, turn your mess into a message. Well, the mess for me was the grief process and, and the acute sense of loss that I felt. And, wrapped all that up as best that, as I could and I turned that into the TED talk and the TED talk is about death and little death and for your for your listeners little death uh is a translation of the French phrase uh petite mort which um is also another name for an orgasm and so the other time that I feel completely out of control where I surrender is when I have an orgasm so that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> you need to watch the TED talk to see how on earth I connected those two very uh, disparate concepts. Yeah. Um, and even though I've let the cat out of the bag, so to speak, I can still highly recommend watching it because, um, yeah, I don't want to say too much, but I know a reporter said what you did on the stage was far better than um, Meg Ryan. 
So apparently, it's... <laughs> apparently but I, I will leave it up to your listeners to decide. Exactly. Yeah, they can email you, stay in touch with you, because um, I can, um, you know, you had, I think it was over a million views in a short period of time for that. And obviously it caused a great stir and people are still watching it. So turn on your light bulb, people, and go to listen to Phyllis Pondis' TEDx talk. And I'll put it in the write-up so people... All we'll have to do is press the button and click. And um, yeah, I, I'm curious because um, you also um, are running an amazing show of your own at the moment called a TV show called A Little Bit of Lip, which is also commissioned by Netflix. And I'm just intrigued why you chose the lips. And because when I watch your trailer, and seeing you sitting in front of Sydney Harbour Bridge on that lip lounge, it was like, wow, I'm just intrigued why you bought it and where you bought it and what inspired you. Um, I'm, I'm a huge fan of um, Salvador Dali and that and um, Elle is actually a reproduction of um, one of his artworks, one of his, one of his very famous artworks, which is on display, I think, in one of the Dali museums, either in... Um, it's it's in Spain. Whether or not it's in the in his little hometown, I'm not sure. But um, it is there and on and on display. And he was what I love about him. He was one of the foremost surrealists, and he just uh, was a real kind of maverick. He didn't care what the world thought of him. He just created, and he was, I think, the embodiment of what um, a true artist is. So from that perspective, I feel really connected to him and his confidence and his brashness and so I've I've always been a big fan and I and there was a time when I had and I still have it but the but the band keeps snapping off um one of his most famous um uh, paintings is of the melting you know clock and watch and it's called the disintegration of the persistence of memory and I've just come back from New York and we went to the MoMA and oh. I stood in front of one of them and I'm like oh my goodness and I've got I think I've got a photo here if I could get it up in time anyway um so that's why I bought L, and then I've always wanted to have my own my own talk show, whether it's you know small, big, in between, whatever. For me, I ha I get such joy uh, having conversations with people from any and every walk of life, and the biggest buzz that I get is when you see me talking with someone who you perceive in a certain kind of way, and then when we talk, and that intimacy is established what you find out and what you discover about that person is completely different to what you thought going in and that therein lies the magic and so then I just thought a little bit of lip and the show was born fantastic and um yeah I guess it's like the old cliche never judge a book by its cover and it's great that you're finding the true gems inside people and mm -hmm. um I know also that you um, created a YouTube channel, A Little Purple, and do you want to tell us how that came about and why? Uh, well, that's all part of part of my same channel, and it's because uh, I'm a big fan of Prince. And, um, yeah, when he passed away in 2016, uh, towards the end of that year, I got on a plane and I went to Minneapolis where they um, staged a thing called the celebration and uh, that's Prince would do that every year but of course this particular year was um, particularly special and they basically open up his home Paisley Park in Chanhassen and fans from around the world just converged on this one spot and the energy was palpable you could just feel him there it was quite remarkable and I just took my iPhone and I interviewed lots of people from um, his hairdresser who worked with him for 30 years to some of his bodyguards um, band members and packaged all that up and just created the um, dig if you will um, the diaries and you can you can watch all these great interviews with interesting people who work with Prince in his orbit on my YouTube channel Fantastic. And wow, you're so dynamic and thinking outside the box. There's so much um, change at the moment. A lot of people have lost their jobs or they no longer, longer exist. So for people who are reinventing themselves or for school leavers, 
um, what tips would you give them to to find work or how to start up? Um, in what particular field? Just just in general? When in, they're, when they're yeah, in general. Or... Because yeah. I find I, a lot I, of people are lost. Yes, yeah. Listen, I, I would first and foremost, be yourself. Be yourself, keep your boundaries intact. Um, and because I'm discovering that even in my 50s, boundaries and keeping them um, titanium clad is still um, huge. But but also when you are yourself, 100% yourself, you will only attract people who dig you and want you. And the reverse is also true. So if you're not being yourself and you're trying to slot into um, a situation that you really want to belong in, the universe will conspire in such a way, or even just the people that are in this particular tribe will oust you in a very unceremonious way and it hurts. And I've had an experience like that in the last little while. And I can tell you, it doesn't matter how old you are, it, it really stings. So the best advice I can give you is be yourself. Um, there's a, there's a great, um, another cliche, but I really subscribe to it. Your vibe attracts your tribe. So, and I say this to my sons all the time. Um, when you are yourself and people react against that, it's a fantastic culling mechanism because you realize um, exactly who is for you and who is against you. And one of my favorite writers and poets, Maya Angelou, um, said one of my, or well, actually, if not my favorite quote of all time, and that is, when someone shows you who they are, believe them, believe them. So, yeah, I guess, Beverly, the um, main advice is just um, do explore and explore the opportunities that are going to bring out the best in you whether it's the relationships that you choose to have platonic or romantic or the work you know the line of work that you want to do and it, it, it's we we all we all have gifts that we need to share with with the world and it's just a matter of doing things that actually make you feel alive i you know and there's um even if you're in um, a position right now and, and you know, the work doesn't really juice you and you feel that contrast of it doesn't feel right, there's something that I just can't quite put my finger on, it's the people, is it the work, what is it? Make another choice and make it as best as you can. And, and I think Beverly and I were talking about this before you pressed record. Um, ask for help. You know, our um, guides, our ancestors, God, whatever deities you believe in, they are there to serve us just like we are here to serve humanity and I really believe that yeah I totally agree with everything you said and I love Maya Angelou as well and we all need someone to aspire to and um you know um what how do you juggle because you mentioned about your children juggle your children and work um, well, they're very, very large boys. It's hard to juggle them. <laughs> um, one's five foot eleven, and one is taller than me. Probably about five foot four now. The other one, he's thirteen. Um, it's well, their father is extremely supportive, and so we kind of balance balance them between us. He does a lot of shift work, though, so we, mm. you know, if he's then you know I'm um, um, taking care of the boys, but. Um, it's not easy. It's not always easy. I don't have hired help. I wish I did. My mother is 92, so there's only so much that she can do to, to, to help. They're, they're quite independent, though. I mean, if, if um, there was a time I had, um, had to stay overnight at a hotel, this is going back a couple months ago, and, you know, the boy's father was working and, there was, and he had to be away, so that he, he couldn't actually be with the boys. So the boys had one night overnight which I call their bachelor time on their own and sometimes you got to let go a little bit and as a as a very feisty attached Greek mother that was a little hard but um FaceTime them all, all the time and that that was all um wonderful but I don't have a succinct witty profound answer to that question Beverly how do I how do I juggle it it's one day at a time it's just 
um, tonight I've got an event that I, I need to go to and it'll just be a question of, you know, the boys come home from school, I might give them a snack and then I'll go and they might go to their, to their fathers. <laughs> but yeah, it's just, I mean, you know how tricky it's been to try and connect over the last few yes. weeks. So, uh, right, but it's all, again, it's um, a question of boundaries as well. How much, and I, I, I do realise this, I oversubscribe myself um and it's it's um I haven't had a true holiday for a long time yes I've just come back from New York but that was not a relaxing let's go and have um pedicures at you know Saks Fifth Avenue kind of situation it was you know running around with three teenage boys um on basically on a school um excursion but my lesson I think for 2023 is to try and take more time to myself and expanding my um creative portfolio so there's there's a lot of exciting stuff in the works and I can't wait oh fantastic and um I saw because I've only recently connected with you on LinkedIn I saw that you are the founder of um lead with love leadership workshops do you want to quickly tell us about those yeah so I'll be rebranding that um this year but I don't want to sorry next year but I, I'm that's still in the works um, and it's that'll come off of um, off the back of a book that um, I'm also working on because uh, I think and I was having this conversation with um, a colleague yesterday that the, the very phrase leadership and leaders has unfortunately become a buzzword and everyone's a leader and every mm. company has a leadership team and uh, team leaders and I think we're just using it too much too often it's lost its meaning people who have no business being anywhere near leading people are being given these roles um something happened to me actually about a month ago and I can't wait to tell this story and I'm going to tell it with as mm -hmm. much uh how can I say this without being um nasty because it's not in my um it's not my style but I'm going to do it with as much respect but with a very heavy dose of um acerbic <laughs> as I can because it was it just illustrated uh, in a very clear way that uh, while we, we can all profess to be highly intelligent human beings with soaring IQs, if your EQ is zero, all of that stuff means nothing. And I think to be a really phenomenal, outstanding, memorable leader, you need EQ in spades. And I really don't believe that industry and industries um, are... Um, making good use of their people and they're just making this person a leader and that person a manager and by the way I can't stand the word manager I'm not manageable we've already had uh, mm -hmm. I think I think you were there when I gave that um speech yeah so um that's another term that I think needs to be abolished in the uh in the leadership space yeah managers. oh I look forward to that talk and if there was one thing that you could do to change the world what would that be I love that question and I love that question because I don't think that we need to change the world on this big grand dramatic scale because we 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 have changed the world right here right now Beverly and we've done that by connecting with each other so I see you as a world I am a world and something as simple as smiling at a complete stranger on the street, having a wonderful conversation, complimenting someone, making someone feel amazing, loved, seen, is changing the world all the time. You don't need a billion dollars. I was watching a documentary the other day on, um, you know, on Kevin Hart, bless his cotton socks. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he's a fantastic comedian, super, super talented, obviously wildly successful. And he's determined to become a billionaire. He's obviously really well off anyway, but determined to become a billionaire because he wants to change the world and my thinking is you don't need a billion dollars you don't even need twenty dollars to change the world all you need is a very strong sense of who you are and the gifts that you have to give to the world and the rest just falls into place thank you that was great it's like what you started off by saying with your father it's all about connection and it's about love and I think love is enough. If we can come from the space of love, everything else flows. And that's a great way to um, change our world. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much 
and I'll put your website, your two websites and all your TED Talks and your book links and yeah, let's spread the love. Thank you, Phyllis. Thank <laughs> you. Pleasure. It's my pleasure. <laughs> Thank you, Beverly, for your time. Pleasure.